So we are in Hebrews 9, and uh, <clears throat> Hebrews 9, I think I said to you guys uh, last time, it, it's sometimes people say it's kind of like a Romans 8, you know, of, of Hebrews. It's, you know, Romans 8 being kind of like, you know, all of Romans is awesome, but it's kind of that high point of where Paul is putting so much together about justification, sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit, all these things and says, you know, comes to this kind of climax at the end of uh, Romans 8 that talks about, you know, if God is for us, who can be against us because Christ is at God's right hand? And if, if God is the one who justifies, God is the one who declares you to be righteous, that's it. That is the, that is the final and ultimate declaration. God's the one that, that sin is against, and he can declare someone to be righteous. And Jesus is the one who died for sin. And sits at God's right hand and intercedes for us. And if he died for us and God made that provision in Christ's sacrifice, then, then that's it. We have confidence uh, before, before God. And then Romans 8 also unfolds that we have the, the Holy Spirit who intercedes on our behalf. Romans uh, 8 is like that, but Hebrews 9 is also kind of a high point. I mean, it's, there's so much great content in the book of Hebrews, but it's kind of a high point in the book of Hebrews like that, that puts together so much uh, content and talks about the the once for all uh, sacrifice for Christ. And while that term, once for all, welcome to the show, uh, once for all has been used a couple times in Hebrews, in Hebrews 9, the word once for all, or sometimes it just says once, that Christ sacrificed once, it's used like three or four times in this, this chapter. And uh, what we looked at last time, or a couple uh, weeks ago, was Hebrews 9, 1 through, 9, 1 through 10. Talked about, it talked about kind of the setup of the tabernacle and the nature of the, the sacrificial system and the priestly system and the Day of Atonement and the Ark of the Covenant that had the, the mercy seat on top of it. Uh, where the blood of the atonement would be placed every year by the high priest. And so the, the author of Hebrews says, okay, remember these details that showed you things about that relationship to God of what was necessary. And he, he brings out a very simple point. He, he focuses around the necessity of atonement, of being uh, of relationship of a sinful people to a holy God. But he says, look, you know that there's an outer tabernacle that the, the priests can go in all the time. You know, not, not everybody goes in there, but, but the priests can go in there and minister all the time. He goes, but the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, only the high priest goes in once a year. And then he says, the Holy Spirit is signifying this, Hebrews 9, 8, that the way to God, the access to God has not been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. Meaning this, the old system does not provide that full access to uh, the face of God, to the presence of God, to that, that full relationship with God. But that's what the new covenant actually uh, produces. That's what the new covenant promises and brings about. And Moses looked ahead to the new covenant. He said that God would circumcise the heart uh, all the way forward through the Old Testament to Uh, Hebrews 8 quotes Jeremiah 31 that says God says he will make a new covenant that will not be like the old one where everyone in it will know God everyone in it will be forgiven of their sins fully and finally now people in the Old Testament they knew God they loved God there are believers in the Old Testament there are a lot of unbelievers in the Old Testament but they didn't have that sense of finality that they didn't have that sense of completion. They didn't have that sense of full access, and uh, they were a lot more burdened uh, than under the New Covenant. But the New Covenant, what is distinct about it, um, that the author of Hebrews points here, besides the return uh, to, the, to the land, which is promised in the New Covenant as well, so the New Covenant has those aspects that still need to be fulfilled, but the author of Hebrews points out the the two things that God says, I will write my law on their hearts, meaning 
that their hearts will be changed. God will do an internal work through his spirit to transform people to love him, to prioritize what he prioritizes, to be convicted of sin, to actually want and desire relationship with God. Um, And that he says, you know, he writes the law on the tablet of the heart rather than on tablets of stone. Well, you remember that Hebrews 9 even talks about God wrote on, you know, the tablets of stone, the law, and then the law is placed within the ark, and then the ark is put into the Holy of Holies. So the author of Hebrews is drawing this out and says, if God is writing the law now on your heart, he's saying that's like you are now the the temple. You now have that access to God through Christ. And then uh, in Jeremiah 31, 31, that's quoted in Hebrews 8, it it talks about God will uh, forgive their sins and remember their sins no more, meaning there will be a full uh, forgiveness, a full knowledge of forgiveness that could actually cleanse the conscience. And so that's what the Hebrews 9 is laying out this logic and is saying, if a new day of atonement has taken place, then there is a new system. There is a new system that has, has come in Christ. And so that's what we looked at last week. There's Hebrews 9.11 talks about that before that it says there, the way to God has not been fully disclosed. That relationship with God has not been fully disclosed, but it says in Hebrews 9.11, but when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered into the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. And so it's saying that Jesus, he didn't go into the earthly temple or the earthly sanctuary. However, the earthly sanctuary is just a model or a copy or a pattern of a reality God wanted to represent in earth of something that was true in heaven. So Jesus actually goes into heaven to complete his uh, work as the high priest. And last week we looked at the fact that unlike the old system, which could kind of cleanse the flesh and God did provide it for maintaining the system and, and maintaining that that sense of relationship with God, sacrificing animals could not take away the the sense of guilt of sin. It could not satisfy the conscience. Uh, It it could not also bring the system to a sense of completion because they had to continue the sacrifices uh, year after year and day after day, the, the regular sacrifices and the Day of Atonement. And so the last week we looked at the, the sacrifice of Christ actually cleanses uh, the conscience. Listen to uh, Hebrews, um, well, I'll read 9, 12 through 15 just to catch us up from last week. It says, uh, and this is talking about Christ entering into heaven, the true tabernacle. It says, and not through the blood of, bowls, uh, the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, contrast there, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so you see there the, the once for all nature of the sacrifice of Christ and that he actually uh, obtains eternal redemption, not that it has to continue to go on or that you're not really sure if the work was done. And then verse 13, it says, it provides this contrast in a, in a rhetorical question here. It says, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer and the sprinkling of those who have been defiled, uh, who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Um, And there's a great contrast between those two verses. It talks about the blood of bulls and goats on the Day of Atonement versus the blood of Christ. Jesus offers his own blood rather than the blood of bulls and goats. And he can do that once for all. But it also talks about the ashes of the heifer, which were, you could... If you touched a dead body in the Old Testament law, you would mix these ashes of a heifer and you'd clean yourself off 
with this ceremonially to, to cleanse yourself from the defilement of touching a dead body. But in Hebrews 9.14, it says, the sacrifice of Christ cleanses us from dead works to serve the living God. And I emphasize that that word serve is, we use the word serve in English, it connects to a bunch of ideas. But this particular word here, serve, is the word for priestly service. Now, it's saying that every believer in the new covenant is a priest before God, has that access to God that can no longer do dead works, but can serve the living God. And so, when we talk about, uh, if you know, which our church is a Protestant church, but a lot of people are uh, Protestants just because it's what they've grown up with, or Protestants of convenience rather than Protestants of conviction, or it's just people choose a team, you know, it's a party spirit or whatever, they don't like the, you know, the kind of formalistic systems of Catholicism, whatever. But this is where you would get the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, that every believer is a priest before God through the work of Christ. That's what the new covenant uh, in Jesus brings about. And that there's an actual cleansing of our conscience that the old system cannot, uh, cannot bring about and wasn't meant to bring about, that it wasn't meant to satisfy the conscience. But now, Jesus' sacrifice can, is God's uh, way of saying, and Jesus' presence in, with God right now at his right hand is God's way of saying, it, it is totally done. You know, maybe you've confessed sin to someone and they've actually forgiven you and that relief that you sense when somebody, you know, actually forgives you for your sin. But we're talking about God, who, you know, all, all sin is ultimately against, against God. Sin doesn't even make sense if, if God... Uh, doesn't exist because then everybody just defines sin as things that they don't like. So God, sin is transgression of God's law. And so the sacrifice of Christ actually brings about the, the knowledge that you can have a clean conscience before God. Uh, and so that's review from, from last week is that Jesus enters the true tabernacle and he never left and is still there now. And he can, his sacrifice once for all can cleanse the conscience. Um, this time we'll look at, Hebrew, starting in Hebrews 9.15, that talks about that Jesus is, so if you're you know, taking notes, you can uh, label this section, which we'll do 15 through 22, uh, 22 or 23, um, as the, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Like, like Moses, like anybody uh, who, who mediates, brings about a covenant from God and is the one who is uh, enacting the covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant by his death. He's brought about a new uh, era in, in history. That, and there's, you can't go back once that the, this new era has been brought about. And this... Um, the example that the author of Hebrews gives next, this section can kind of be a little bit confusing, but I don't think it has to be, is he gives kind of the example of a testament or a will. Like, you know, sometimes people put those words together. This is my last will and testament. And that's actually one of the reasons why we call it the Old and New Testament, is that they are the uh, words of God that have been given to explain the, the work of God in history and that they are the, the testament, the, uh, the laying out of what is now to be expected, what is, what is new, what is the thing that, that God has done, how are we supposed to understand what's going on. And so now the author of Hebrews will say, just like Moses, Jesus is the author of a, or a mediator of a new covenant. And so he is the one that brings us about through his own blood and through his own death. Um, but let me read Hebrews 9, 15 and following to, to kind of lay this out, because it's going to make a statement that's going to sound a little bit, you know, tricky to deal with, but I think it doesn't have to be real complicated. But Hebrews 9, 15 says, for this reason, 
He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is only valid when men are dead. For it is never in force while one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. Uh, for when the for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled the people, uh, sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, "This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you." Uh, and we'll stop there and pick up the verse, the rest of the verses in a bit. So it lays out this logic that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. But then it says, and he brings this about, brings about the eternal inheritance. Um, And Hebrews 9.15 is a great verse to go to of how do we know that the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament believers, that they were saved by the death of Jesus as well, even if they didn't know that the Messiah was going to be Jesus of Nazareth. Um, Well, it says here that the death took place for those who were under the first covenant. The people who believed, like Abraham, Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. And so his death covered those who were uh, believing in the the Old Testament. So this verse uh, actually says that, for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. Um, So... But it talks about the the promise of receiving the eternal inheritance. Now, the the confusing part of this is is in verses 16 and 17. It says, "Where where a covenant is, there must of necessity be a death of the one who made it. And it says, for a covenant is only valid when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Now, if we think about that, those two statements... You, can, you may think, okay, well, wait a second. There are other biblical covenants that I can think of where the one who made it, whether God or a man or whoever, or both, they didn't die. And so how can the author of Hebrews say there's not a covenant unless the one who made it is dead? And Because you could think of like the Noahic covenant, which is not made by Noah. It's made to Noah. It's made by God. God doesn't die to make the Noahic covenant, or the Abrahamic covenant, God makes the covenant uh, unilaterally, but with Abraham, and Abraham doesn't die, same thing with Moses, um, and same thing with the David, the Davidic covenant, David doesn't die, and then the covenant comes into, uh, comes into place, so what's the author of Hebrews getting at here? Well, it could be a couple of, uh, couple of things, I think the best way to understand this is he's using the word covenant in a more narrow sense. Covenant uh, could mean a a lot of different uh, things. It's a word concept that can catch a few different ideas. And I think he's narrowing it down here to the idea that, like I said, of a, a testament or a will. That a will is only enacted after a person uh, dies. It's, it, and once that person dies and the will is in, in place, it's in force, you, there's no going back, is the point. But even you can see with um, the Abrahamic covenant, there's a sacrifice of the animals in Genesis 15. In the Mosaic covenant, which is going to be talked about here, there's a sacrifice, of, they're covering everything in blood, even the book of the covenant, and sprinkling the people which we'll get into, but sprinkling doesn't, it doesn't mean this. It means hurling blood over everyone and everything. So it's, it's taking a palm branch and, and flinging blood all over everything. And so the people, the book of the covenant, everything is, is covered in blood. This idea of that, that all this nice stuff, needs to be stained and covered with blood in order to inaugurate the covenant. So there's a death that took place, but of, you know, of an animal. And so 
anyway, the, the idea here now is that Jesus' death has brought about now where it's the, the testament or the covenant that he brought about in his blood and by his death is now in force. And the author of Hebrews is making the point to his, his Jewish audience that are tempted to back away from Christ and, and return to Judaism. He's, he's, he says, there's not going to be a second new covenant. There's not going to be an alternative. There's not going to be another sacrifice for sin. There's not going... All, it, it's Jesus or nothing. There's, there's nothing to go back to of the old system. In fact, the old system moves you to the new system. Um, it's kind of like... Uh, and the Old Testament is still God's word. It's still true. And the law of the Lord is supposed to be written on our hearts. But that also drives us, if we're consistent with it, drives us to Christ. And uh, I've heard it said that it's like, you know, let's say that somebody's uh, drowning, like you're on a boat, and somebody's in the ocean, and they're drowning. They fall overboard, and they're stuck in the water. And you go over, and there's this life raft, and then there's the directions of how to use the life raft. The directions are true, but they point to the life raft, you don't take the directions and throw them into the person who's drowning in the ocean and say, okay, take this. You know, these directions are really good and true and everything. And that's all the case, but that will not save them. The directions point to the life raft that can save them. So it's the Old Testament points to uh, salvation and Christ. You can't throw somebody the, the Old Testament, which is a system that has these built-in insufficiencies that always pointed to uh, a completion, a fulfillment in Christ. Um, so we, you know, the author of Hebrews, and we should too, love the Old Testament. The Old Testament is God's word, but to be consistent with the Old Testament is that it points to Christ. And once Christ's death has taken place, there is no old system to go back to. There is no old, there is no sacrificial system. Uh, to go back to, and and even false religions uh, continue a system of uh, sacrifice because their conscience is not clean. The continuing sacrifice shows that they know they have consciousness of sins. Hebrews ten says that the continuing nature of sacrifice, um, whether that's just pagan religions that sacrifice. Maybe they do human sacrifice. Maybe they do animal sacrifice. Whether that is the repeated sacrifice of the, the Roman Catholic Mass and their whole priestly system that ignores the, the once-for-all nature of Christ's sacrifice, the, the representation of Christ over and over and over again, uh, that shows a continuing consciousness of sin because Hebrews 10.18 says, once you know you've been forgiven, once there's forgiveness, sacrifice ceases to be offered. And so once you either have the sacrifice of Christ once for all and at God's right hand, uh, or you have consciousness of sin and you continue offering for that reason. And I told a story last week, I, I, some of you heard it, of, uh, to illustrate this idea of uh, a will. Once a person dies, a will is in force. Um, and I talked about you know, the, the shame of the story that Jesus tells of the prodigal son in Luke 15. What that story is actually supposed to be is Jesus is showing on purpose Everything in that story is shameful about what the son, the prodigal son does. Uh, and one of the most shameful, disrespectful, dishonorable things that he does is he asks for his inheritance. He asks his father for his inheritance early while his father is still alive. So the will is not supposed to come into place until the person has died. But the prodigal son is so uh, arrogant in his sin that he, he approaches his father and asks, hey, I want my inheritance, and he goes and squanders it and all this. And, you know, but Jesus is illustrating the nature of uh, repentance in that story. And so uh, that's part of what's, uh, what's so offensive about the story of the, the prodigal son. Uh, and so the author of Hebrews is illustrating here 
that a will takes place. It brings about a new era after someone died. I shared a story from, from our family. So my great-grandmother, Graham, who came here for a lot of years, um, she, you know, she lived till 96. She had a, it was kind of funny, she'd be in her 80s, and she had a, a stepmother who was probably like a decade older than her or something, right? So, but it would be funny, she'd be like in her 80s talking about my mother, and people would be like, you know, they'd see this little lady walking around and then talking about her mother still being alive, but she, she was only, you know, a few years older than Graham. But it meant her stepmother, which is my Aunt Louise. And my Aunt Louise had a sister uh, named Sally. And uh, my Aunt Louise and Aunt Sally came from a family that was just not very good, didn't treat them very well. They were great, but their family, uh, their, both their parents and the family they came from and their, their children um, were just people who, who were, I mean, just kind of greedy, worthless people who just, I mean, did all kinds of uh, nasty stuff to them. But, so, Sally, you know, made a pretty good life for herself, and, uh, but all these, her kids, grandkids, people were all kind of like waiting for her to die so that they could get her, their hands on her money, even though they didn't really have a good relationship with her and all that. And uh, my grandparents, you know, warned her, they're like, Sally, you better, you know, watch out for these people after you die because, you know, the truth is they, they are kind of vultures. They don't really care about you. And, and Sally was fully aware of that. She goes, oh, you don't worry. None of these, none of these people are ever going to touch my money after I die. And they're like, okay, we'll see. You know, and so I don't know how she did it. But so after she eventually died, there was going to be the reading of the, the will and the, you know, kind of laying out of, all right, here is what, what she left, here's who it went to. And so all the kind of, you know, kids, grandkids, people coming out of the woodwork to kind of pick apart, you know, what, what was left, you know, show up. And they're kind of competing with each other for who is the heir of Aunt Sally's inheritance. And they're showing up, you know, like trying to push each other out of the way, basically, to, to get there first and say, no, 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 I'm the legitimate one who should be receiving this. So, but then, in the reading of the will, they discovered that all that Sally left them was, a, she, she had money, but she must have, like, I don't know what she did with it. She must have given it to charity. It's, it's a mystery. We still don't know. But all her money was gone. And then she went and bought all kinds of stuff on credit. And so all she left in her inheritance was a bunch of debt to these <laughs> these vultures who were trying to, you know. So uh, <laughs> that's why my grandma Gail said it. Sally was always her hero. Um, so, but then they they scattered like roaches. They didn't want to be the heir anymore. To, to <laughs> so, but the funny thing about that. So the principle there was though, after the death has taken place, and the will is in force. You can't go back. The will is now operative. You cannot. You cannot say, "Okay, well, wait. I don't want the will to be um, to be in place and, and running and and to be the the new stage." So it's. Uh, but you can't go back. And so that's what the author of Hebrews is saying, that now that the death of Jesus has taken place, and now that a new day of atonement has taken place, <coughs> Jesus as the high priest has entered the true tabernacle as the high priest. There is a new system. You, there is no going back. The will, the testament of Jesus, the, the new covenant, it is operative. And the only way is through Christ. And so that's what the author of Hebrews is saying here. So listen to, to the um, idea here, because in uh, Hebrews 9.15, it talks about the idea of it in inheritance. You inherit something in a will, right? But listen to Hebrews 9.15 and following un, you know, with that in mind says, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal, uh, eternal inheritance. So here's the inheritance for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. So think of like a will. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant 
Moses' covenant, was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Okay, so, we'll pause there for a minute. So, talks about, compares Jesus to Moses and says, Look, the, the first covenant involved blood, and Moses made a sacrifice of, uh, remember if it was bulls and calves here, uh, but anyway, it talks about that it was inaugurated with blood. The sacrifice begins the covenant. And that, that sacrifice represents that death that, that inaugurates, that starts the covenant. And that everything is covered in blood. And that's what the idea uh, that he, the author of Hebrews is going to get at, is that the new covenant things need to be cleansed and covered with blood as well. Except this time, it's the blood of Christ. But he, bring, he says that, it's according to the law that the law of Moses gets the law from God on the mountain, presents it to the people, gives a reading of the law. And then, but the law is not operative yet until Moses in Exodus 24 performs this sacrifice, covers everything with blood. And that's when the, the old covenant system actually starts. That's when it's actually begun. And so... Exodus 24, 8 is quoted here by the author of Hebrews, where it says, this is the covenant which God, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Now, Exodus 24, 8 actually says, behold the blood of the covenant. Okay, so I know it seems like, okay, well, the author of Hebrews is obviously uh, quoting the idea of what Moses said, that's true. He's not changing the text or saying that the text said anything wrong. And some people trip over things like this, um, especially with Hebrews, is they want to go back and say, okay, well, Hebrews must have been quoting the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. But it doesn't match the Septuagint either most of the time when people say that. So people get kind of obsessive about like, Okay, well, they're not quoting the Hebrew exactly as it's quoted in the, the Hebrew text. So it must have mean, mean they're quoting the Septuagint. But it actually doesn't match that text either. I think what the author uh, of Hebrews is doing and has done is he's bringing out different words to emphasize the idea of what the text is saying. And here I think he's blending two ideas together. He, he quotes... Moses saying, behold, the, the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you. But I think he's also making a reference to Jesus in Matthew 26, 28, where if you hear this phrase, this is the blood of the covenant. It sounds like Jesus the night before he's crucified, when he says, he breaks the bread, he gives them the cup, and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood and then gives them those, those commands about doing these things in remembrance of him. So Jesus announces, like Moses, the author of Hebrews and, I believe, Matthew, are, are trying to get us to recognize Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. He's bringing, he's like Moses, bringing about a new covenant, a new era, but this time it's not in the blood of the uh, calves and goats that... Uh, that's sprinkled on the people in the book of the covenant, but it's by his own blood. And so the author of Hebrews here, it's pr pretty clever, but they would have, I think the Christian Jews would have picked up on this, that this it's the echo of these two verses, Moses and Jesus both starting uh, a covenant. Moses beginning the old covenant, which looks ahead to the new covenant. Jesus bringing about the new covenant. Uh, in his own blood. And look at verse 21. It says, And in the same way, both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry uh, of the ministry with the blood. In the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry with the blood. I Meaning Moses is covering everything uh, with this blood. Staining everything with the blood to to cleanse them, to be, sanctify them, to begin the covenant. So the author of Hebrews says, 
This is what needs to happen as well by Jesus in the true tabernacle in heaven. Not because it's dirty, not because it's sinful, not because it needs to be cleansed in that way, but because it needs to be sanctified with the sacrifice of the new covenant. And so verse 23 says, Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things, the tabernacle on earth, the copies uh, of these things in the heavens to be cleansed with uh, with these, but the heavenly things themselves with sacrifices better than these. So saying, look, if the earthly tabernacle, God required it to be covered in blood in order to inaugurate the covenant, it is only appropriate that the heavenly tabernacle should be, in a sense, covered with Jesus's blood as well. Now, that does not mean that Jesus literally has to bring a, a bag of his blood into, into heaven. It means that Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, that, that whole uh, concept of his sacrifice is viewed by God as, uh, as one uh, act of sacrifice that has been completed um, and that, as Hebrews talks about, has brought about eternal redemption that has now sacrifice can, uh, can cease. And so, listen to verse 24 as it lays this out. It says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay, so that verse is really significant. It's that Jesus did not go into, he, he visited the temple, we know that, but Jesus never He's not of the tribe of Levi. He, according to the law, would not have been allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. Jesus would not have done that. There's no evidence that Jesus ever went into the earthly Holy of Holies. However, remember when Jesus gets killed on the cross and his sacrifice, appeasing the wrath of God, atoning for sin, that the veil of the temple is torn. And then Jesus' work is, is not complete at that point. I mean, he, he does say it is finished. The sacrificial death of Jesus is complete, not to be repeated. But he also has to rise from the dead. And this is why there, there, this is the importance of a biblical worldview in the scriptures, is because there are, there are unbelievers. There was a college professor back years ago, unbeliever athe atheist at uh, USC, who said there's a lot of good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. But all that proves, he said, is just weird stuff happens. It doesn't prove he was God. It doesn't prove he was, you know, that, his, that our sacrifice for sin and our justification with God is complete and accepted. But we have the scriptures who, that give us both the historical fact and God's explanation of what's, what's going on. We're not left to just guess about these things and say, okay, well, I think it would kind of work like this. You can't put your hope in just, you know, speculation of, well, it would be nice if God kind of worked things out like this. And so the author of Hebrews explains that part of the resurrection is that Jesus had somewhere to be. Jesus ascended to the, the right hand of God as the high priest, and that is the completion of his high priestly work. And unlike other high priests who always stood and always entered and left the Holy of Holies, Jesus enters the presence of God, sits down, and never leaves. That's why the author of Hebrews emphasizes so much that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Uh, that's a technical term in Hebrews that's first used in Hebrews 1, 3, and 4, and then is continued to use, uh, be used throughout Hebrews. It, it is a term that... Uh, catches the whole idea of the completed work of Christ. So that the fact that Jesus sat down at God's right hand. And there's, there's some debate about this. Of Does that mean Jesus is on the th one throne next to God or on a throne separate from God? And there's some believing debate on both sides of that. But really what that means is God is Jesus, the man, has sat down at the right hand of God in a place of equal rank and authority. And the importance here is that, well, that would all be well and good, but if we're not united to Christ, what does that have to do with us? Well, that's the central 
doctrine of the union with Christ, of being united with Christ, which is all over the, the New Testament, but it is kind of a, um, it's an underdeveloped area of, uh, of study, actually. But the idea is that, I mean, even Ephesians talks about, um, it says because it emphasizes so much in Hebrew, uh, in Ephesians 1, in him, in Christ. And then it says that Christ is seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. But it also says because Jesus is there and because you're united to him, if you're a believer, your position is seated with God in heavenly places as well. So I messed with the Awana kids once teaching on Ephesians. I was like trying to, I said, okay, if we're united to Jesus, where's Jesus now? They're like, okay, in heaven. Okay, yes, sitting at the right hand of God, right. Now, if we're united to Jesus, we know we're here, but if we're with Jesus, united in Jesus, and we are together with him, where does that, the Bible say that we are? And one little girl was like, in heaven? And she was like, like kind of giggling, like uncomfortable about, and I'm like, that's exactly right. It means that we are, uh, yes, physically we're here on earth, but our position in Christ is in heaven, seated with him. So that idea of union with Christ, listen to, it talks about that he is uh, there in verse 24, now to appear in the presence of God for us, as our forerunner, as our priest, as our representative. That's how we know that we have uh, access, uh, access to God. And this, this word here in verse 24 is highly uh, provocative, this word presence. We, we understand, you know, the importance of the idea of God's presence or things like that, but really it's the word face, that Jesus appears before the face of God, that Jesus has that close intimacy with God. Now, Hebrews 1 emphasizes Jesus always had that as the second person of the Trinity, that he is the image of the invisible God, that he is the exact representation of God's nature. But Jesus incarnates as a man and takes on all the status, all the truth of being a true human as well. And Hebrews also emphasizes that Jesus, the man, goes back into heaven, which a high priest was not able to do, and goes into heaven, and a man sits down at the right hand of God. That, that's why it talks about Jesus being the mediator of a new covenant, that he is, uh, he, he is the one between God and man, because he's the only one in that category who is both. Um, and it, Paul talks about in sec, uh 2 Timothy 2.5, right? Or it's 1 Timothy 2.5. There's one God. 1 Timothy 2.5. You can check me. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so Jesus is the only one who is both. Um, and Jamie's done some work, obviously, on, on Job. He never talks about it, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, but he's done some work on, on connecting Job to uh, and seeing that Paul may be picking up on a, an idea in Job where Job talks about in Job 9.33, I wish there were some sort of mediator who could put his hand on both of us. There, he, the New American Standard uses the word umpire. <laughs> I wish there was someone who could, if you put your hand on God, by the way, that means you're equal with God. You can't put your hand on God and, and not die as a, as a human being. But he, he says, I also want a, a mediator redeemer of someone who can actually identify with me and, and represent me before God. Um, and so Job asks for this, but doesn't have the fullness of God's revelation. Well, now we do. I mean, it says that this is, this is Jesus' role. He's the mediator of a new covenant. Uh, and then it says that Christ, he, yeah, he didn't enter the, the copy, but he into heaven itself now to appear in the face of God for us. That, that, that's how we know that we have uh, access with God. Uh, and this gets so uh, cheapened. There's these series of uh, commercials that I've been seeing recently about this whole message, it, it ends with being about Jesus, uh, allegedly, but it, it's the whole message is that he gets us, 
And that's true that Jesus does get us. I mean, Jesus does identify with us. He is, he is a man who takes on all that and, and is our true representative. But it it's, goes out and just says all this stuff that, oh, this guy once went out walking and he just invited everybody to the table. He didn't care. And some people didn't want to come to the table. And that was sad. It's like, what are you even talking about? Or they'll, they'll show these, you know, that they'll show these gang members in the street and they're like, yeah, there was once a gang member. There was once this gang that was walking around that, fl- that the authorities hated as well. But they didn't understand him. He gets us. And they're saying that about Jesus. And it's like, it, I don't want just somebody to get me and just be like, oh, that's, you know, yeah, I, I get that there's suffering and stuff going on in the world. But I want someone to represent me before God and to provide a sacrifice and to be a mediator before God and to be right with God, not just somebody who, you know, kind of in a vague sense that, you know, this example of some guy named Jesus kind of just gets you. It's, it's not enough. Uh, but this is what God says about Uh, in his revelation about what Jesus has actually accomplished. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to speculate. Uh, We don't have to make up or try to say, I kind of wish things were this way. This is how God has said it actually is. And then look at verse 25. He says, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. So it says that Jesus is not going to continue offering an offering, right? If you went to a, a Roman Catholic congregation, you would, if uh, faithful Catholics go into a mass service, and as they enter the door, they cross themselves, and then, that's, that's neither here nor there for me, but then they turn and they bow, they genuflect. They are bowing to the altar, uh, which is the bread and the wine, because their doctrine since around 1215 uh, AD has officially been that Christ is there, that God is there. They bow to God in the sacrifice. Uh, And then Jesus, looking different in an unbloody manner, is re-offered. Same sacrifice of Calvary. They don't say that, they say that it's through time, but they say that the same sacrifice of Calvary is re-offered to God as a propitiatory sacrifice. And a propitiation means to satisfy the wrath of God. And that means that that continual sacrifice and continual priestly system, plus, I would argue, the idolatry of worshiping God through an image um, of the elements of the Mass um, shows a, a continual sacrificial system that is, that is not complete. It only approximates the failure of the old system. That's the best it can do. It cannot bring about um, forgiveness. And so that's, this is one of those areas where biblically we, we cannot join uh, with, with Rome on this. This is, it has locked itself in to a point where it may even arguably be irreformable at that point uh, of its continuing sacrifice. Now, do people know this to be the case all the time? Probably not. Are there people who are believers in Christ truly that are within Catholic churches at times? Yes, but they did not get the, the saving gospel of Christ that the the New Testament teaches from the Roman Catholic Church. The Hebrews 10 will go on to say that the continuing nature of the sacrifice shows that it isn't complete, and then it contrasts that with the completeness of the sacrifice once for all of Christ. And that's what we have here. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year, with blood that is not his own. And it goes on in verse 26 and says, Otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. So in other words, sin is so 
various. Sin is, is so uh, great, and or we sin a lot, and we sin in so many different ways, that if it was the case that Jesus' sacrifice needed to be repeated in some way, the author of Hebrews said, then basically since the world started and there was sin, Jesus would have been having to offer over and over and over again himself since the foundation of the world. But then it says this, makes this division. It says, but now, another great but now statement in the Bible, but now once at the consummation of the ages, he, is man- he was manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so he says, the author of Hebrews points out here this word once, again, he says, sometimes he says once for all, which should be, in my opinion, have hyphens between it because it's one word. It's a Greek word, uh, hapax, H-A-P-A-X in English. And it, it means once for all. Uh, Peter uses this, 1 Peter 3, 18, a form of this, that, he, uh, that Christ died for our sins, that he was crucified for us once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And that word once for all doesn't mean once for all people. It means one time. It means one time not to be repeated. It means it is a numerically conclusive idea, meaning it only happens once and it does not happen again. And so, unlike the old system, and so Christ has now brought about a finished sacrifice, and as the New Testament points out, as the author of Hebrews does here, the sacrifice and death of Jesus in God's economy, God's way of saying how things work, that is the most significant dividing line in history. That is the most significant event that has taken place. That is the the continental divide of of all history is the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. That this has had cosmic significance as Colossians 1 talks about that this is what gives Jesus the right to rule the world. And so that's why he talks about that now once at the consummation of the ages uh, Ephesians 1 talks about the summing up of everything in Christ, that it's, that it's all about him. And then in this sense, that Jesus is inescapable, that if God has made his son the preeminent one of all history, the head of creation as the creator, the head of uh, spiritual creation as the head of the church, the one who's going to rule the world, the one who's Uh, purchased a kingdom for God by his blood, that all history is going to be under the rule of Christ, and that he's going to rule where Adam failed, and that he's in charge of everything, people have no choice but to deal with Jesus. And so that's what the author of Hebrews is saying to his Jewish audience. He's saying, "You, you cannot miss what has gone on in Jesus. You can... It'd be one thing if they didn't know about it, right? If they, you know, were still um, Jews under the old system who hadn't heard about Jesus yet, and they're still, you know, sacrificing and stuff like that, like the Jews who had heard of, you know, the teaching of John the Baptist. So they kind of knew about Jesus, but didn't know fully what was going on. That would be one thing. But now you have to deal with with Jesus, and he's the uh, only way of salvation. And you can think about that uh, this is not politically correct, but the Bible still teaches Jesus is the only way. And that's not controversial here. But, I mean, if you think about, you know, people all around the world, well, what do they need? Well, they need to come to Christ. Um, And there's these statements even of, well, Muslims, Jews, and Christians all worship the same God. but knowing about the sacrifice of Christ, which Muslims and uh, Jews re- reject, uh, is, is not. Uh, it's acknowledging what God says in one place in his word while rejecting what God says in another place in his word where he's spoken in Christ. And so they refuse to deal with Christ on uh, God's terms. Islam rejects the idea that Jesus was crucified. Um, you can't get away from that. That's, that's the central 
message of Christianity. Uh, Mormonism, they recognize Jesus was crucified, but they even try to ignore the cross and say, you know, while we think the cross was necessary, we can't glory in the cross. And you have places like Galatians 6, 14, where Paul says, I won't make my boast in anything except the cross of Christ. And so there's, there's not an option to deal with, uh, to, to not deal with Jesus, to avoid uh, coming to Jesus and either accepting or rejecting, or, I mean, people can, can wait, but that is an incredible danger to wait uh, to come to Christ. Um, and it's, it's actually a disobedience to the call of the gospel, which if God has really spoken in his son and commanded that everybody repent, then to say I'm going to wait um, is, is disobedience to what God has commanded. But listen to, as it finishes up here in verses 27 and 28. Oh, back up just a little bit to 26 is it just this read the statement again that he is man, he was manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself it's just that unique language that he is not only covered sin in a generic sense but that Jesus has actually put away sin whereas Jeremiah 31 talks about that God doesn't remember our sin in the sense that he does not Remember when Jamie taught about the idea of remembering. God does not bring our sin to the forefront of our mind because of uh, Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. And so in verse 27, it says, it establishes a logic. It says, inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. In other words, you have one, you die, and then there is judgment. That is the path of, uh, of all human beings. And so there is death, and then judgment is faced. And so it establishes that idea with Christ as well. Verse 28 says, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So remember earlier on in Hebrews 9.11, it talked about, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, now it says Jesus has accomplished the work that is the consummation of the ages, and it's all about him, and he did this by his one sacrifice, accomplished eternal redemption, is in heaven, and now it says the next thing, big thing, is that after death comes judgment, that Christ, having offered himself once for all, is coming back, and that that's the going to be the next event. He's not coming back to do another sacrifice. There's not another new covenant. There's not another option. There's not another sacrifice that Jesus is going to do for sin. He's going to come back uh, for the salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly uh, await him. And so that's the, the hope of the believer is the return of Christ. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, look, all this has been done for you in Christ, and I know that you're suffering now. I know that you're tempted now. I know that there's a pull of going back to Judaism. I know that there's persecution, and these things are happening to you. But he says, Christ is coming back for salvation after having accomplished all this. So he gets to the main point in Hebrews 10.23, which is hold fast your confession. Just hold on to Christ as a matter of survival, but your perseverance and holding on to Christ and being loyal to Christ um, is not only salvation, but he's going to come back and rule the world. He's going to come back and, and uh, save, uh, save his friends. It's, it even doesn't really emphasize the judgment here. It talks about he comes back for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. And then Hebrews 10 will continue to uh, go on and elaborate on the nature of of Christ's sacrifice. Well, let's uh, close in prayer and then go to worship this morning and uh, that together. Lord God, we thank you for your word that does not leave us in the dark and in speculation about what you have done in Christ and what it means. Lord, we thank you for his once for all sacrifice that is able to cleanse the conscience, that he is the only mediator between God and man.
that he's brought this about by his blood. And the Lord, we thank you for um, his, his final uh, sacrifice and that he is in your presence now that gives us that access uh, to you that is not had by those who do not, uh, do not know you, Lord. So Lord, we pray that as we worship this morning, that we would be conscient, uh, conscious by your spirit uh, in our worship of that our worship is made possible uh, through the sacrifice of Christ and his position now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, John.